and then to the next stage of development where we became agriculturalists and instead of hunting for food we began growing it and breeding it now there following an understanding of what makes animals increase in number and what makes the um, plants grow so that we can produce good and worthwhile crops then what we've done basically in the words of your question is to understand the natural laws and principles which govern agriculture and stock breeding and we can think of so many other things as well we used to ride horses then we have railways railroads and then we have the internal combustion engine then we have airplanes with propellers followed by jet planes followed by landing on the moon and each of these significant stages in human development comes about because somebody with a truly inquisitive and brilliant mind has examined what makes things happen and once they've analyzed what makes things happen then they can begin to use what they have analyzed in order to control and um, go back to my interest in martial arts when you have studied what particular movement will take an opponent off his feet or take him over your shoulder onto the mat or what will produce a very rapid submission then what you're doing is to look at the ways in which you can apply superior leverage superior balance once you have learned the science of leverage and balance then you can achieve victory over a, a bigger stronger opponent right now if we apply those same laws let's just think of what the great medical scientists have done over the years how they have first of all discovered the existence of bacteria and have then discovered methods of destroying bacteria um, and all the, the amazing modern things that are being done with stem cells to restore damaged tissue if we look at an objective and we say it is to heal to strengthen to cure illness once we've learned the laws which cause illness and which produce and encourage healing and we then apply those laws we can achieve the objective of saving life easing pain and bringing about a much better life condition for the patient that I think this applies through everything that we do in fact I would almost go as far as to say that it does rather show the intention of a benign deity who has put us in this world that we are here to find out and perhaps just like love and kindness are the cardinal virtues so curiosity isn't a long way behind them the the virtue of being curious seeking to know why things do what they do is the way that we make progress and when we combine curiosity with a strong ethical sense so that we want to understand something in order to prevent suffering or to bring about greater human well-being and happiness then we are fitting in with it's almost as if the universe had been designed to be an ideal environment for those who were both ethical and curious yes I agree the power of thought Yep. You know, throughout many different holy books, they talk about the power of the word, you know. Yes. Um, yeah. And do you believe 
we can actually create or destroy using the power of the spoken word? Well, if we go right back to the earliest developments of uh, what, for want of a better term, we could call magic or enchantment, nearly every ancient legend that we've ever read in which a magician or a witch, someone with magical powers or purportedly magical powers is involved, then so very, very often the magic consists of a particular format, of a chant, of a liturgy, of a ritual. And what I rather wonder is that the power of the so-called magical spells depends upon getting the mind focused. You know, we were speaking earlier of reaching down into the subconscious so that we could hold those levers and wheels that actually release the power of thought in the place where we want it to go. And I think that we will all have come across situations where people singing together, chanting together. Think of a big sports event where the fans of one particular team will either be chanting the team slogan or they'll be singing the team song. And that seems to have an effect on the players to give them additional right. strength. And then if we think of it in a religious situation where prayers are chanted, hymns are sung, and where certain liturgies and rituals are used repeatedly, I have a suspicion that such chanting, singing, and repetition of prayers can open that trapdoor into the human subconscious so that we are able to release that power of prayer and uh, that power of thought which comes out of the prayer. I mean, the good St. Paul said, pray without ceasing. Now, I think he was saying more than just giving advice to the members of the new church of which he was a missionary. Right. Uh, I think that he had realized that to pray continually or continuously and to keep that stream of prayer going was in some way that he did not perhaps understand and which we are only now beginning to explore, that could release the power of the mind. Now, if we think of how this can be used by dark forces, by negative forces, you will find that there are certain uh, fanatical and extremist groups who will chant over and over again. Let's just take the Nazis as one example. That constant chanting for Hitler and the, the repetition of the, the arm gesture and the Heil Hitler noise. And, mm -hmm. You know, we've seen those old films from the late 30s and uh, early 40s when the Second World War was on. This was a, a, a Nazi rally somehow seemed to release power among the fanatical Nazi supporters. Now, I had a very great friend that I worked with years ago. His name was Victor, Victor Barnett. And he had been captured at the start of the Second World War, and he spent four years in a prisoner of war camp. And he described how when the American forces had uh, arrived, <coughs> I'm sorry, he described how when the American forces had arrived and were liberating the prisoners, or about to, the German guard in charge of the prisoners loaded everybody into lorries and said, please, if we take you to the American lines before the Russians get us, 
the Russians were coming from the other side. And Victor and the other prisoners went with their former guards, who were now more or less their prisoners, and to the uh, American advance guard, who immediately put things right for them. Now, on their way in the lorry, and here were German guards, adult guards, who were retreating in terror from the Russians. And they passed, and I'm coming back to this idea of fanaticism, they passed a group of Hitler youth who were operating a very small field gun which wasn't really powerful enough to stop a Russian tank. And as they passed, Victor said, I will never forget the expression on the faces of those teenage boys who were dying for the Fuhrer and enjoying it, firing their inadequate little field gun at a great range of Russian tanks who would, Victor said, as soon as we were clear, the tanks would have been over them and they were dead. And he said it was the look on their faces. Now, that was that indoctrination, fanaticism. This, if you like, is the dark side of using repetitive prayer, repetitive liturgy. It's the dark side of what you can do to the human mind if you literally brainwash it in that way. So that the power of prayer or of religious or benign thinking does enormous good, whereas the repetitive power of fanatical recitations of these crazy beliefs of such fanatics does a great deal of harm. It makes perfect sense. Absolutely. Okay, so we have a dating website called datinggirl.com, and it bases um, the matchmaking strategy on Pythagoras study of numerology. What is your take on numerology? Right. Well, when we were, I'd like to pick up the idea of numerology from what we were saying a little earlier about the power of the laws of the universe and the way that the universe is structured that everything follows certain principles and I think it was Sir James Jeans, the great physicist and cosmologist who said nearly a century ago that the universe is a thought in the mind of a pure mathematician. <laughs> so numerology is exceptionally powerful um, because the numbers are the keys that help us to understand let's take the three major sciences of chemistry, physics and biology we can't as students of any of them get very far with our studies unless we are able to master the numbers that underlie the way that it goes um, for instance, the number of seeds in the head of a sunflower is pretty consistent. The, the numbers of cells in a given organ. So biology, which seems the least numerologically dependent, is numerologically dependent. And as for physics and chemistry, well unless you have the kind of mind that enjoys number work, physics is not the best